if you've ever been in a situation, maybe you have, but have you ever been in a situation where you were in something, but you weren't in what you thought you were in? Let, let me explain. Just recently, on a recent trip to the States, I was walking through a mall. It was a new city. Uh, I was with people I didn't know, and so I had some free time in the afternoon in between some sessions. So I said to them, could you take me to the mall? Now, the reason I was going to the mall was because my bags hadn't turned up, and so I had to get some, uh, some, uh, some you know, a few bits and pieces. And so I'm walking through the mall. I I've got about a three-hour window. I'm not in a rush. I don't need much. And so I'm doing the, the new millennial-type walk, which is not a swagger. It's nothing like that. It's head down on mobile phone. You know what I mean? You know, you walk through the Trafford Centre or the Arndale or some shop and, and you know that sometimes it's dangerous walking through the malls because where once upon a time you used to have to avoid crazy people with prams, now you've got to just avoid crazy people on their phones. Am I right? Come on, am I right? Let me ask you this question. Have you ever had a moment where, where you've nearly tripped or you have tripped or you've run into someone because you weren't watching where you were going, you were on your phone? Give me a wave if that's you. Just go on YouTube and uh, you, can, you can type into YouTube uh, something to do with, um, with people's fails while they've been on their phone, people falling into fountains and people tripping up and falling down escalators. It's hilarious. And, and there I was in this mall texting and then, and then nature called. Now, I don't need to explain any more than that, do I? I think you understand what I mean. Nature called, so I looked up, I saw a sign. It's in the States. It said, restrooms. So I, I walked towards the restrooms. I, I walked towards, I walked to where you go left or right. Uh, left takes you into one set of changing uh, restrooms. Right takes you to another. I'm on my phone. I look up, I glance, I turn. I walk into the restrooms. And when I walked into the restrooms, I realized that these restrooms had no standing room variety. So I thought, well, maybe with political correctness and some of that stuff that's going on today, maybe this is just the way we're going now. So I, so I went into the cubicle and I shut the door. And as soon as I locked the door, I instinctively knew that I was in something that I did not want to be in. The penny dropped moments later as I heard the click clack of these ladies coming in with high heels. And I knew I was definitely in something I did not want to be in. Uh, the trouble is this, these two ladies who came in after me, one went into the cubicle on my right side, the other went into my cubicle on my left side, and they are having a conversation over the cubicle. She said this, and then he did that. Are you kidding? He never did that. He absolutely did do that. So what did you do? Well, I told him this and I did this and that's why I'm out shopping, shopping therapy. She says, good girl, did you get those shoes? She said, I didn't just get one pair, I got three pairs and I got the handbag. And then it went back from shopping into him. I don't even know who he was. All I knew was this, I was in something I did not want to be in. I was in something, I had no idea what I was in. My problem was this, now I'm in, how do I get, how do I get out? I actually think this is what's going on here in this Bible verse. Jesus says this, many will think they're in, but they're not really in what they should be actually in. I gotta be really honest, right? Not many things scare me, really not many things scare me. This verse, does scare me. This is Jesus speaking to the church. This is Jesus speaking to his followers. And he's saying this, he's saying, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy? Did we not preach? Did we not go to church every Sunday? Did we not give our tithes? Did we not sow into the building offering? Did we not support the community impact teams? And yet Jesus said this, I tell you, for many, I will say, away from me, I never knew you. The Apostle Paul, the great preacher, the great New Testament apostle, he, he talks about making his body a slave to himself, a slave, lest he preaches and still loses his soul. I remember my dad, who was a preacher, saying one day, he said this, he said, when we get to heaven, we'll be surprised who's there and we'll be surprised who's not there. And I think part of the reason is, is because one of the things I'm observing across the planet are people who are in, but they're not quite in. This verse scares me. Now there's not many things that scare me. 
Got to be honest, my mum scares me. Five foot one and a half, the little Welsh dragon they used to call her, they still do. Mrs. Barrett, Mrs. B. They, they, she, they used to call her the little general. I think I told you once, I said to her mum, why are you so small? She says, Glen Boyo, she was Welsh, she's Welsh. Glen Boyo, perfume comes in small bottles. I said, and so does poison. And I ran off, I tell you, she got that shoe off. She's been living in Australia long enough to know how to use a shoe as a boomerang. And it hit me in the back of the head from 30 yards. When my phone rings and it says, mum, my knees start to knock. Because my mum's brought up in that generation, you know, just kind of her generation, her upbringing. She doesn't ring me to say, hey, how you doing? Notice the weather's good. No, nothing like that. If mum wants to, a casual chat, she'll send me an email. Saw the fires in Saddleworth. Saw the fires up on the top of Bolton, praying for everybody. That, that's my mum's way of connecting. When she rings, I'm in trouble. Now, baby, she lives on the other side of the world. I can't get further away from my mum, but she, she knows when I'm being naughty. She knows. She's like the eye of Sarah on searching for her pressure. She knows when I'm up to mischief. The other person I'm scared of, I can say this because she's not here, she's in our Chester campus, is my wife. Seriously, Sophie gets two looks in her eyes. I'm sure I've told you about this. One look is a look of adoration. Another look that says, if you open your mouth one more time, I'm gonna kill you. Because she's a woman of God, she'll raise me from the dead just so she can kill me again. I, I have been simultaneously in love and scared of Sophie for 24 years. But this verse scares me. Jesus is actually saying here, you can be in, but not in. And one of the things I've observed globally in the church, uh, uh, the, the, the more I travel, the more I see is, is the danger of a generation of men and women who are in church, but they're not in church. In Luke chapter two, it's a story where most Mary and Joseph take Jesus who's the age of 12, they take the Son of God, they take God to the temple for a festival. It's really a festival of God. It's God's party. And how beautiful is this? In Luke chapter two, Mary and Joseph lose God at God's party. And I, I wanna suggest that if Mary and Joseph can do it, we can too. That the danger can be that we can be in church and miss the point that we can be in the right seat every Sunday, but our heart and our spirit be disconnected from the reality of what is going on in this place. Folks, would you all look at me for a moment? Those of you who are taking notes and playing Angry Birds, playing poker on your phone, look at me for a moment. The danger is people who are Christians by culture rather than conviction. People who are Christian by heritage rather than a heart elevation towards Christ. People who are Christians by, by values rather than a revelation that it was your sin and my sin that violated Christ and held Him to the cross. It's the challenge and the danger of a generation that are in, but not really in. Now, folks, we preachers, we see it all. We see everything when we preach. We know who's listening. We know who's passing notes. We know who's, who's, who's there but not there. We, we see it when the lights are on but nobody's home. And as I travel and as I see more contemporary churches like ours, I see it time and time again. It's, it's what I'm calling on this particular tour that we're on, the over-churched generation. Now, I love our nation. I love flying into Manchester. I love looking out across Stockport as we come into land and, and as you fly over Cheadle and when you take off and different things. Uh, and as I look around, I notice all around the greater Manchester and Cheshire region from the plain, I, I notice steeples everywhere. As I drive up our A roads and B roads and, and, and what are those blue ones called? Motorways, as I drive up those motorways, I look left and right, I see steeples everywhere. People know church. People say to me on planes, trains, and in automobiles, what do you do? I say, I'm a pastor of a church, I'm a minister. They say, you don't look like a minister. I'm like, thank you very much. Do you know how many people walk into this building and go, this ain't church? Do you know why? It's because our nation knows church. And folks, the danger for you and I is this, is the more we're in this, the less we can be in this. 
So that in that day when we step into the presence of God full time, there's that moment where many, Jesus says, will, will, will not enter because the danger was the more we were in, the less we were in. If I can break this danger down just for a moment before we pray, the danger is this, is that we're a generation that is over-churched and underwhelmed. We've been in so many church services and so many conferences that now we've been so much in, we are so underwhelmed by things. It was St. Augustine who first penned these words, familiarity breeds contempt. And I really think that's what Jesus is getting at here when he's speaking these words. He's talking about a people who become so familiar with the presence of God and so familiar with the church that we are now over-churched and underwhelmed. We see this through Scripture genu genuinely in 2 Samuel chapter 6. We have this moment where the Ark of the Covenant, now folks, the Ark of the Covenant was the presence of God in the Old Testament. The presence of God, the power of God. And the Ark of the Covenant lived in a man's house called Abinadab, Abinadab. And it lived in that house, the, the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God was, when, was, when, was in Abinadab's house for 40 years. Then one day the king decides he wants to take the presence of God from Abinadab's house and he wants to bring it to the city of David. He wants to bring it back to Jerusalem. He wants the presence of God in the capital of Israel. And so the Bible says the king and the men, they, they went to Abinadab's house, they picked up the presence of God, the Ark of the Covenant, and they put it on the back of a cart that was being pulled by oxen. Mistake number one. You see, when you read the Bible, you begin to realize that the presence of God was never meant to be foot pulled by some mechanized format. In other words, the presence of God, friend, doesn't sit and fit in a liturgy. The presence of God does not fit in a type or style of song. I believe that in the same way we can worship with passion here, we should equally worship with passion uh, in, in, in quieter surroundings as well. And so they made the mistake of pulling the presence of God in a mechanized format. The presence of God was never meant to be carried that way. The presence of God in Scripture was always meant to be carried on the shoulders of men and women. We're meant to be carriers of the presence. It's not just about turning up to a church that has a sense of the presence of God. But you and I, friends, we're called by God to be the carriers of His presence. So mistake number one. Then the Bible says that as the oxen was pulling the cart with the ark, the oxen stumbled, the cart slipped, and the, uh, the, 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 the ark started to slide off the cart, at which point a young man called Uzzah reached out his hand to stop the ark from falling on the ground. And in that moment, God struck him dead. How's that for encouraging? I remember being quite small reading that and saying, God, that, that, that just ain't fair. So many passages in the Bible that I've, I've had to earmark and bookmark to come back later because I can't quite understand what's going on. Why did God strike Uzzah dead? Surely Uzzah was just trying to help God out to stop God from falling. Well, if we replay the story and go back a little bit, Uzzah was the son of Abinadab. You remember that the presence of God, the ark, lived in Abinadab's house. And so Uzzah literally grew up in the house of God. The presence was there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And every day uh, uh, Uzzah would walk past. He knew that the presence of God lived in that lounge room, lived in that sitting room. There would be a custodian guarding the ark. And yet here we have it later on that Uzzah is struck dead. My question is this, is why was he struck dead? Was it because he was familiar with the presence of God? Well, I don't think so. I don't know about you, I wanna be more familiar with God. 
I, I, I wanna be able to hear His whisper clearer in, in a crowded room where there's noise all around me. I, I wanna know God's heartbeat more. I want my heart to break for what, God, what, what breaks God's heart. I, I don't think it's familiarity that was the problem. I think what happened here for Uzzah is that familiarity crossed over into contempt. And I think the danger that I see globally is this, is I see men and women who are in church who, who really begin to, 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 to treat the house of God and the presence of God and the worship of God and, and, and the book of God with so much complacency that it's almost now as though we are touching the sacred and making it divine. Ah, oh, sorry, touching the sacred and making it common. And I think it's a dangerous thing because it seems to me the more we're in, the less we're in. So as I travel, I go to churches, speak to large churches, large congregations, large conferences. And there are many times when I look out and the posture I see is this. Preach it, white boy. A posture that says, I've been in church such a long time. What can you tell me? that I've never heard before. Do you know who our pastor is? Do you know who our preacher is? Listen, friend, I want you to know, if God can speak through a donkey in the Bible like He did, God can use any man, any woman, any child, any boy, any girl, that when we open the Word of God, I really believe that what God wants us to have, come on, somebody, God wants us to have a posture of openness, a posture of learning, so that whoever is preaching, whoever is leading, friend, whatever songs we're singing, it's not based on how good the stage is, it's based on the openness of our hearts. I had a family who joined our church. The reason they joined our church is because they loved the mission of our church. They joined our church to be on team within the life of the church. But over a, a, a period of time, they said, well, the only reason we're in relationship is because we're in team. If we weren't in team, we wouldn't have relationship. Started to sit back, started to lean back. And of course, they've now left the church. Why? You see, the thing is this, is what brought them to church was mission, was team. The vision of team and mission brought them to church, but no longer was the vision and the mission enough to keep them in church. What happened? I want to suggest familiarity crossed into contempt. Jesus' says, many will say, I worshipped, I preached, I prayed, I gave, I tithed, I sowed, I was on team. And, and Jesus will say, away from me, I, I, I never, never knew you. The second thing I, I'm aware of with this, with this, the breakdown of this danger is a generation that are over-entertained and under-impressed. We live in Manchester. What a great city to live in. It's always like this, every summer. Ian Brown, was it got it right? Manchester's got everything apart from a beach. We should build one, shouldn't we, in Jesus' name? Is that for a vision for a city? What a great city. Tuesday night, I'm going to the cricket. T20, England versus India. Come on, England. I'm going, to be, I'm going to be thinking about England thrashing Switzerland. Who are we playing? Colombia. I'm going to text Falcao on Monday, say, help a brother out, Falcao. Just, would you just take a die for us? Just lose. Just, just, just own goal, something like that. He, 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 yeah, he won't. Entertainment at every turn. Do you know in 2016... The Manchester Arena had more concert goers in that venue than any a venue in the world. Was it 2.7 million people went to concerts, to gigs at that arena, 100 yards up the road. We have a city of entertainment, it's, it, it's brilliant. And one of the things that I've noticed is this, is, is the danger is that we are in, 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 a, in a generation of people who are over-entertained and under-impressed. And the danger in a church like ours is this, is that we have to become more entertaining in order to become more impressive for a season, which means the pastors, preachers, teams have, have got to, at times, got to, got, to, got to jump through hoops, juggle 97 balls on stage whilst being entertaining. Now listen, don't get me wrong, I believe the gospel of Jesus Christ is entertaining. 
And I believe that, that the preaching of it should be entertaining and I believe there should be entertainment. But folks, don't get me wrong. The problem that I notice is this, is that in an, in an attempt to, to entertain an over-entertained and under-impressed generation, um, generation we, we can, the danger is we can end up preaching a politically correct Jesus. And he ain't. Did, did you get me? The, the Jesus of the Bible, he's not politically correct. The, the danger that I notice is this. I, I, I've got a friend, I've got a friend who, who, who large church uh, in another part of the world, preached a message, listened to it on podcast, rang him later. I said, bro, great message. You didn't mention the Bible. Where's Jesus in the message? Because the danger is this, is that in an over-entertained and under-impressed generation, the new Jesus for 2018 demands nothing, asks of nothing, but my friend, the last time I read the book, he's still the King of Kings. He's still the Lord of Lords. He is still the great God who makes demands. He makes requests. He says, be holy for I am holy. It is not a choice. It is a demand. Wow, this is a heavy word. You're with me, aren't you? We're friends, aren't we? Over-entertained, under-impressed. The third thing I notice is this, is a generation that's become overindulged and underfilled. You ever been to a buffet and eaten so much? You kind of thought to yourself, I am never gonna eat again. But the thing I've found is this, the more I eat, the more I wanna eat. And in a generation of men and women who are eating at every turn, I'm not just talking about food, I'm talking about every area of life, their uh, identity and, and hedonism, pleasure, sexuality, everything like that, we become overindulged and underfilled. Need more, need more, need more. How much money is enough money? Never enough. Need to have more. When is the right car the perfect car forever? Never. Need a newer one. Have to get a, a bigger one. Now, this sense we're just not quite satisfied. In the book of Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament, the wisest person to ever live, his name was King Solomon. He did a social experiment on this. Uh, it's, it's what we call, what I call the magic it. I spoke on this at Luminous Conference last year. It's the search for contentment. And in Ecclesiastes chapter two, he says here, I denied myself nothing. It was all meaningless. Uh, yet when I survived, su surveyed all my hands had done, everything was meaningless and nothing was Gained. He did everything. He had relationships. He had money. He, he did building projects. He built extensions on his extensions. He had everything he could ever want. And he said it meant nothing. And his summary in this social experiment is in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. He said, here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. What happened to fearing God, folks? Oh, not you, because this service is perfect. I'm really talking about the 12 o'clock service. Folks, what happened to the fear of God? That sense of God, I, I hold you in such high esteem. I would never do anything like this because I honor you with such reverence. Fear doesn't mean to quake in, in terror. If we were to break down what fear means, several shades of meaning, it means this. To fear God means to acknowledge His good intentions Fear of God is produced by God's Word. It makes us receptive to wisdom. It gives us proper perspective of ourselves. The fear of God helps us when we're tempted. It motivates us to become more like Christ. And so when King Solomon says that we should fear God, that's what he's saying. I love my wife. I love my wife. I'm free to do whatever I want. Of course I am, but I love my wife. And because I love my wife, there's certain things I don't do. So come and check my history browser on my computer. You're not gonna find stuff on there that you shouldn't find and not because I know how to delete, but it's because I love my wife. And it's my love for my wife and fear of her wrath, just a little bit, because she's crazy. And Solomon says, the two things are the best, to fear God and keep His commands. And do you know in the New Testament, Jesus breaks the commands down to two things, to love God and love your neighbour as yourself. 
So what would happen if in 2018, we as a church said, you know what, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna fear God and we're gonna prefer others. We're gonna fear God and we're gonna prefer others. I got a, I got a feeling that, that when we do the ice cream vans on a Sunday and the hot dog stands and the nachos like last week and the burger vans, everyone will be preferring each other. You go first, no, you go first, no, you go first to love God and love your neighbour as yourself. Folks, that church, that generation would change the world. Because no longer are we in it for ourselves. We're in it for the betterment of someone else. And I need to finish. One of the musos will come and join me. And notice this, the fourth thing. is a generation that is over-churched and under-reached. Over-churched and under-reached. We know church. And the more you're in our church, the more you'll know church. Folks, look at me, you, you'll, you'll know the liturgy, you'll know the sound, you'll know the feel. You'll know when the band are, are brilliant and when the band are struggling. You'll look around and go, the lights aren't working too good this week or the lights are working. Sometimes you'll know when the preacher's on the money, man, perfect. And other times when the preacher's gonna struggle. We know church. Our nation knows church. A nation where now the percentage of people who go to church is less and less, but it's amazing how even those who don't go to church know church. We go for births, for deaths, for christenings, for weddings. Easter, maybe. It's pretty amazing to me how, how people kind of can go to a place and they bring a certain persona with them of what they believe is the expected persona. We never walk into a funeral and go, well, hey, let's party, baby. You just don't do it. We bring in an expected persona. Can I just say this? When I die, please just make it a party. Like, yeah, cry a little bit for sure. Cry a little bit. If you don't cry, I'm going to come back and haunt you. But, but make, it, make it a happy cry because when I'm dead, baby, I ain't dead. My Bible teaches me I'm more than alive, more alive than, than ever before. And you know, when my dad died, when my dad died, it was uh, obviously a sad day, but, but just this moment, this, this revelation hit me that, that, that he's more alive. See you soon, Dad. Hebrews 11, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. See you soon, Dad. Because this is not it. And it's amazing how people can walk into church and bring a pers expected persona. And so we, we go into churches for births, deaths, funerals, weddings, blah, 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 blah. And we, it's almost like we have a personality change when we come in. Because we know church. But it's a generation that I see globally that's over-churched and under-reached. Some time ago, I went into a new Christian's um, class. And uh, I think Paul was doing the teaching, Paul Reed. Uh, inside a stage, Paul, well, Paul was speaking. Come on up, Paul, for a sec. Just stand on the edge there so people can see who I'm talking about. Paul was speaking, and, and I, heard, I, I heard what we were teaching our new Christians in that new Christians class. And afterwards, we had a conversation. And I said this, I said, hey, Paul, what would happen if we stopped talking about here's what you do as a Christian? What would happen if we just began to go, here's Jesus? Because the thing is this, we all know rules and regulations, and we were all trained, weren't we, really, that rules were made to be Of course, Moses comes down the hill with 10 great commandments, impossible commandments. Nobody could fulfill them, which is why Jesus had to come. The perfect God man lived a perfect life, fulfilled all the commandments, died on the cross and dying on the cross, He took all our sin or all our hurt, the punishment that should have been upon our shoulders, Jesus Christ took upon His for you. So Paul, what would happen if we get out of the way and just show people Jesus? And, we started to have the conversation. There were others in the room. Well, what, 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 about, what about people who are living like this? And what about people who are doing that? And what about people who are involved in that? I said, no, let them do it. Let them do it. And eyes went up. What do you mean let them do it? Let them do it. Let's just show them Jesus. You see, I loved being a single boy. I loved being single. I could leave my socks on the floor and get away with it. I could leave the toilet seat up if I wanted. Who cared? I could do whatever I wanted. But then I fell in love. 
And I knew this girl was much smarter than me, that I had to change. Because the bachelor boy was not gonna make it as a married man. I had to change. But here's what changed me, love. I changed because I knew she loved me. I in turn loved her. So that brought change. And in a generation that's overchurched and underreached, we know church, but do we really know Jesus? Do we really remember what it's like to be in true, vibrant, living relationship with Jesus Christ? Folks, I don't want you to just know audacious church. We love you being part of the church family. Our heart's cry is that you know Jesus is that when you come week in, week out, when you go to your small groups, when we take communion in a few moments time, you have this moment, this epiphany again, this is about Jesus. Because I wanna tell you, it is your love for Him and His love for you that will bring change far quicker than a desire to just do the right things. We need Jesus. And I notice these four things, the generation that's over church, underwhelmed, over church, under impressed, uh, over entertained, under impressed, over indulged, under filled, over churched and under reached. Because here's what I've discovered. You can be over churched, but you can never be over presenced. Something happens in the presence of God. And when you get bored by church, and when you get bored by meetings, and when you get bored being in the band, and you get bored doing and living for God in the way you do, listen, I wanna encourage you again, that happens to all of us. There are some Sundays when I wake up and go, like a day off today. But I'll tell you something happened to me when I was 12. It changed me forever. I encountered God's presence. And His presence changes everything. I want you to know online, right where you're watching right now at home, God's presence is with you and you can know the presence of God in your life.